Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's webinar. We are with Russ Carrington and we're learning how to set up a regen farm. No pressure, Russ. Um, but just before we come to Russ, what have you been up to, Nick? Well, I'm very fresh back from skiing. And I'm and still, with... still awful at it. So annoying. I, I don't know what it is. It's my, I think it's my age. I just, I just get so scared going down too steep. But you know, when you really want to do something really well, and I'm just, if I saw myself on a film, I would die. Oh my word, I'm just awful. Um, but no, so we've been away for a week to Chamonix and it was really good. Um, and then this morning I went early shopping because we didn't have food in the house. And it just made me realize how awful our supermarkets are in comparison to French ones. Oh, the service, the food, everything just grim. Um, so you move um, into France? I did do a little bit of Googling of farms in France. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're quite nice. It's quite it's just a nice climate, isn't it? But um, but saying that, talking about climate, the, the, the serious lack of snow out there and um, kind of a little bit of an underlying worry in the resorts about climate change and snow. Um, and it was just really hot. I'm not that tanned because I had all my mask on, but um, um, yeah. Anyway, what about you, Liz? Uh, I have oh, been the, busy. I've been in, the, ironically, I was in Cumbria when you weren't, oh. which is unusual. Um, yeah, and just, yeah, talking at the moment, doing quite a lot of meetings with farmers, setting out, setting their objectives for the year coming. So it's quite exciting. So yeah, interesting things. I went, was with a farmer who might be on the call, but yeah, his obsession with earthworms. He wants more earthworms. That's what his mission is, which is, as I said to him, he wouldn't have said that two years ago. It What's his aim? Not, What's his more, to, more than one. Oh, oh God. Is that it? Yeah, they're quite poor levels. On like certain an fields. An arable farm? No, grassland. Oh. So yeah, we, I've now, um, any, any clues on how to increase earthworms? Right in the chat, um, just just one thing I forgot. So if anyone, so uh, we drove to skiing because we're trying to save the world and Renna won't fly, and um, <laughs> and so we listened to lots of podcasts. And anyone who hasn't listened to Michael Blanche's Time series of podcasts, they are amazing, just incredible, and in, in his normal hilarious style. But it, they're just really good to listen to. Um, but anyway, on with the show, Liz. Yes. So we shall um, hand over to. So, Russ, you're going to sh uh, sh share some slides. Sorry, can't quite get those words out. And um, and then give us a bit of a background to yourself and also how you started the process with NEP. And as we go through the slides, if you've got any questions, please type them in the chat or the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen. And then either Nick or I will relay it to Russ. Um, and we'll and then. Once the slides are finished, we'll, we'll open it up to wider conversation. So thanks, Russ. Over to you. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Great to be here. And uh, welcome to everybody that's uh, tuning in. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview, really, introducing myself, those of you who don't know me, and um, tell you what I've been up to at NEP over the last couple of years, just to really share some photos of what's been going on and to... Uh, set the scene and hope then we can uh, have a really good discussion and welcome all of your uh, questions. So hopefully I can share a screen which you can all see. Um, <clears throat> so um, just get it moving. So as many of you know uh, I was pretty involved in uh, running the Pasture Fed Livestock Association or Pasture for Life as it's known uh, for quite a few years um, since, since, it's, since its inception in 2011 um, and really enjoyed kind of working with farmers right across the UK and Ireland that were on a bit of a journey to try and discover um, different ways of managing livestock and managing grassland and I really learned a huge amount from them all during that time and um and really enjoyed kind of facilitating those discussions and 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 seeing so many people going on journeys uh setting up farms and changing the way they farm and <clears throat> that really led to uh the pasture for life certification mark which many of you will know it's owned by 
uh, pasture for life now and, and really guarantees that uh, beef and lamb has come from animals fed purely on pasture or conserved pasture. And, and I'm sure many members will be on the call and, and seeing that organisation and that, that brand growing from strength to strength, uh, which is really great to see. Um, and, and really that, that came out of the farmer discussions when we realised how important it was that we were able to influence consumers and help them to choose and support uh, farming in a way that helped the environment and helped animals and helped the farmers. So that's really where that, that certification mark was born from and, and try and balance what the market is looking for, what people uh, like to see and, and want to feed themselves together with what works on farm and how we can push the boundaries on farm of what might be achievable and then how the science is able to support or, or back that up and, and develop an understanding of what the benefits are of feeding animals different pasture uh, and, and grazing in different ways. So a hugely interesting few years, um, but really Regen Ag became, very much came in vogue during, during the time of, of running Pasture for Life and, um, and lots of different versions and definitions of it. And I wanted to really sort of share my version, I'm sure you've discussed it lots on this series of, of webinars, but um, for me, Regen Ag doesn't really have a specific definition or blueprint. And instead, I, I feel that all farming sits on a bit of a spectrum and we can look around the world at different practices that perhaps sit on this, this spectrum that I've shown here. Um, and, and to the left, we've got degenerative practices that are leading to soil depletion or um, damage to the environment and then to the right we've got practices which are which are rebuilding and regenerating and we could say that somewhere in the middle is is what, what we term as sustainable it's kind of managing the status quo that isn't what sustainability was originally defined as but that's what society and perhaps we've become used to uh, having it as just kind of protecting and managing uh, the status quo whereas regenerative is perhaps going beyond that towards something else we don't know but if, if we're working towards Degenerative practices, perhaps we're working towards desertification. There's lots of evidence that probably most agriculture around the world sits slightly to the left of the sustainable line. And so for me, it's about how we all move further to the right, all doing a little bit that we can, a little bit of improvements. And we can look at this in, in particular parameters, for example, soil health shown here, and actually how it's moving up or down in, in those sort of three scenarios. And I'll come back to this a little bit later in terms of what we might measure if we are um, trying to understand what we're regenerating. And I think that's really important in this regenerative agriculture movement to be able to evidence and demonstrate what it is we're actually achieving rather than saying we're mob grazing or we've got a, a direct drill uh, and, and that's sufficient. It's about what else are we able to show we're actually delivering. And that's really important, not just for our credibility as farmers, but also to engage with consumers. And I've really seen in the past how important it is to build trust with consumers and, and markets as well to um, get their support for the way we're producing food. And I'm sure many of you have seen these kind of principles of region ag banded around as well. Um, and, and I think they're all, you probably don't need repeating here, but all, all very relevant and something that uh, I've certainly been trying to apply wherever possible, particularly uh, the final point of the integration of livestock. <clears throat> So how does all that sort of fit in at, at NEP? Um, the NEP estate is, is probably known to most people for its pioneer and rewilding project, um, which, which has really been brought to the attention through uh, the book, Wilding, the Return of Nature to a British Farm, which is written by uh, the co-owner of the NEP estate, Isabella Tree. Very well worth a read, really fascinating book and, and depicts a really fascinating story of, of the three and a half thousand acre estate in West Sussex on heavy clay soils that took the decision to actively stop farming and to, to really see an experiment with uh, what nature could do to um, uh, repair the land and, and regenerate many aspects of the environment. And so the, the area shaded in blue here, or, or sort of light blue, is actually uh, the three areas of rewilding on the NEP estate um, and, and there, are, there are different things going on in, in each of those rewilded areas. Uh, the southern block uh, most significantly being most interesting from, a, from an ecology point of view. 
but all fascinating when they're right and and it's really starting to um show just what natural can can achieve for, for nature generation. And it's important to think about these blue areas as areas of biodiversity production that's their main aim albeit that free roaming animals including cattle um uh, horses pigs deer uh, are all part of that system as well and, and are an important part of that ecosystem but the 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 byproduct is 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 meat but the, the priority focus is on biodiversity now some people will know of course that the nepa state has come under a lot of flack for taking agricultural land out of production for nature and and that that you know so that's, that's a regular comment that is heard against rewilding um so for the for the nepa state uh, they were really kind of curious to explore what regenerative agriculture could mean alongside rewilding and so parts of the estate that were not rewilded are shown here in in green and outlined with uh, with red outlines and and these parcels were not rewilded at the time sort of 20 23 years ago now because it wasn't really practical to do so you need uh large blocks of ring fenced areas to to feasibly uh, properly rewild and so it wasn't practical to include these other areas because they're separated by roads much of them around the village of Shipley um, so so they were kind of left some were grazed periodically some were tenanted some weren't really grazed much at all and just annually topped so uh, NEP approached me in 2020 about whether we could develop a bit of a project here to understand how regenerative agriculture can work in Sussex and also fit alongside rewilding. And so we started to scope out exactly that. The uh, green mark fields make up about 350 acres, generally heavy Sussex clay, as with the rest of the estate, um, mostly all permanent pasture, and only about a third of the fields shown uh, have a, had any kind of stock fencing as well, which is an important consideration for later on um, as to how we get that up and running. <clears throat> But in effect, the, the, the three aims we boiled the project down to, and I know we'll, we'll perhaps come back to this later when we talk about you know, where do you start with the region ag project. And, and these were our three important um, goals for the project, to really understand how farming uh, and, a, and a focus on food production could work alongside rewilding, uh, where there's a focus on biodiversity production, actually how we could create those connections between different types of land management. And also really understand how does region ag fit into West Sussex on heavy clay? Is it actually possible? What's its ability to, to build natural capital and, and, and support also the biodiversity? And then finally, to actually produce quite a lot of food, uh, health and nutritious food as well to local people and also visitors to the Nepa State. And the Nepa State are um, at the moment building a, a farm shop and cafe which is going to help cater for the increasing number of visitors that are coming to the estate to see the rewilding take part in glamping and, and workshops. And so there was a wish to supply a lot of a, a lot of the produce to that farm shop and cafe from the Nepa state itself, which required various food sources. So that's really our, our starting point. And from there, develop sort of key food groups that we knew we would um, need to have available and produce and sell in the farm shop to so beef, eggs, uh, vegetables and dairy produce as well. And other meat was also also discussed. Um, but those those were our sort of key starting points and then set about really uh, beginning of 2021, actually uh, setting up the enterprises to do exactly that. So we started with a herd of uh, Sussex cattle, suckler beef to uh, graze and mob graze uh, the farm to uh, produce beef and, and build up a herd that will can regularly produce beef throughout the year. And a flock of chickens to follow behind the cattle and produce eggs. Uh, the market garden seen here and in due course, uh, a small micro dairy for dairy produce. Now, um, well, most of these enterprises are all grass based. We felt that was most appropriate given the land type and its kind of ability to grow grass really well. 
Also, we have to think about from an economic point of view, how could we make these different enterprises stack well together and work well together so that we're not uh, going about lots of cost for individual enterprises, but we can actually have enterprises that can work together to regenerate the whole farm. And, and in a nutshell, we felt that for the beef enterprise, we've got to establish a lot of fencing, uh, water infrastructure that would uh, lay the way very well for then introducing the dairy enterprise at a later date. The pastured poultry would, would stack it well behind the cattle, and I'll show you a bit more about that. And then all of the livestock enterprises would actually uh, produce um, waste that could be turned into compost that we could then use on the market garden for the production of, of human edible food. And so I'm trying to really think about that whole picture, that whole land use discussion around how we how we produce food most effectively and sustainably for, for human nutrition. So I'm just going to sort of flick through a few photos of, of, of kind of how we've been doing all of that. So very simple mob grazing system behind a single poly wire, um, very simple setup, um, lots of temporary water pipes, certainly initially, till we figured out where we actually needed those watering points. And so very cheap, portable um, plastic trough to move around um, and, and very simple pigtail posts, simple poly wire, uh, solar energizer. Um, to move things around. I didn't have a quad bike or anything like that to uh, move this kind of equipment about, so we kept it light, kept it lean uh, as far as possible, and it, it did work really well. A lot of the pastures, as I mentioned, had lots of different kind of um, histories. Uh, some were very much kind of improved, including red clovers and ryegrass. Others, such as shown here, uh, a little bit um, less improved. Various differing amounts of, of weeds, um, or weeds as we call them, but actually other forms of, of plant diversity that um, existed throughout the pasture. But we weren't really too worried about that and really adopted a, a grazing strategy that was um, pretty holistic across the board and, and then start using that to really improve the soil and improve the pasture, which, which it surely did. Uh, and from the air, starting to see very quickly the different mosaic impacts of, of the cattle grazing system. Uh, that's mean them to a next paddock um, and, and really using them as tools to start managing the landscape, which, which ties in really well with our uh, countryside stewardship agreement that we uh, secured to help support financial costs, but also support the type of environment we were trying to create within our grassland. And as far as possible, grazing all year round, this was December 2021, actually beginning to trial what winter grazing would look like, uh, and it was really successful. We did house uh, shortly after this photo was taken for just 90 days. Um, and, and this winter, the team there are actually continuing some of the animals out wintering all year round. And that's another really interesting um, discussion point. Lots of people said on heavy clay, you won't do out wintering. Um, we had a pretty dry winter last winter. We had a horrendously wet, wet than ever December, but the outwintering uh, con continued not too badly. Um, and it really started to demonstrate how the soils had improved their holding capacity in a relatively short time. A um, bit of bale grazing, in particular using that where we're trying to knock back some of the scrubbier areas that you can see kind of established in some of the pastures. And, and using that as a tool to bring in new seeds to some of the pastures, spread seeds around the farm and, and start improving the uh, diversity of pasture species throughout. The Sussex cattle were really great um, in, in this kind of environment. Obviously, they're, they're, they're from the area originally anyway. We used quite a lot of traditional genetics. I bought from three different herds to uh, try and find some fairly pure traditional Sussex genetics that would really thrive well on all pasture diet at all times of the year. And we're pretty happy with um, with how they've been performed. Interestingly, in the rewilding areas, the cattle there are longhorns. So had quite an interesting comparison um, between the two breeds at times and, and just kind of seeing how they're doing, which has provided quite a lot of learning uh, between the team around the, the different breeds and their suitability to different systems. Um, from the air, we're creating some quite interesting uh, shapes, but again, it's kind of seeing how that very informal, rough 
non-linear features are, are, are sort of aiding um, some elements for nature. So when we did house, we housed on waste wood chip from the estate, also some waste paper, um, and, and found that to be pretty good as well, saved a lot of costs in terms of not buying in straw, and then turned that uh, bedding in the spring once the cattle were out into um, some compost. And this is a whole other uh, rabbit hole of to go down in terms of compost and how to get good at making compost and um, being conscious of the carbon footprint of any turning activities and, and plus versus the benefit of the better products you're making. But we've had a good um, trial experiment with that, building up uh, windrows overwintering then that we've then been applying to market garden, um, the beds that we've been building in the market garden. Market garden's two acre site. Most of it um, we, we've kind of done in 75 centimeter wide beds, top dressed with, with our homemade compost. Um, in a in a kind of no dig style and, and horticulture and regen regen horticulture is a whole a whole other world um, that's been fascinating to get to know and and there's lots going on there to kind of minimise that soil disturbance keep the soil structure in in good heart and and this is what our kind of system looks like and you're then able to see directly into um, those beds um, and, and the vegetables kind of sort out uh, their their own routing. Um, in, into your tilled soil, but rather than till those beds in future years, they'll literally be top dressed with our compost um, and, and that go straight into that as a growing medium. I won't talk too much about the market garden um, and, unless it, what people want to delve into it later with questions, but um, you know, really interesting how you think about closing that nutrient loop on a farm um, and actually having an outlet for vegetables. Uh, it, you know, to um, you know, use that that quality compost um, and produce some amazing food. We're really lucky to uh, find a couple, Rosanna and Sina, um, that we're working just outside Copenhagen in Denmark, to come and really help us bring this market garden into fruition. It's been an amazing project. Um, and looks a little bit like this now, or they, that, although that picture was taken middle of last year. In fact, all of these um, brown areas and have, have since grown vegetables, um, and, and it's all about to get get up to speed again. Um, they've already been um, planting seeds uh, this week, ready for the spring. Um, and that's that project's come on leaps and bounds and a really important part of the, of the whole picture at the regenerative farm. Um, and just sort of finally enterprise wise uh, to cover off the ch chickens. So uh, trialed chickens last year for eggs with 120 birds in a Ridgedale style uh, mobile hen house, which is just on the right of the picture here. Uh, really happy with that, felt it worked really well uh, following the cattle. You can just gonna see the cattle in the background. Ended up kind of having smaller mobs um, in front of the chickens to kind of get the ratio of uh, and, and timing of movement better so that the cattle were able to move at a similar pace to the chickens. And, and really seeing the chickens go to work on the, on the cow dung um, and, and eating up the fly larvae um, as they went. And you know, really fascinating to see how that works, see how, also how it impacted on reduced feed intake, dry feed, and also egg quality as well. Um, we're able to monitor that quite closely. We sort of established a local egg round to um, really understand what the local market might be for the eggs, but to get some feedback as well on, on the system we were trialing. And I think later we'll talk about markets and what you're producing and, and how you're going to sell it um, as you're starting out. But of course, bird flu um, has been a bit of a consideration. So these birds went into flock down uh, end of October and are likely there until uh, March, April at, at least, um, which is, is rather sad actually, but it's something that we're all kind of having to face. Um, and so then trying to make as an enriched environment as possible for those birds during that time. Um, but another opportunity here is just to see inside the uh, eggmobile, the rollaway nest boxes, which are really essential. Some um, mobile infrastructure in there as well. Header tank, small header tank for water in the top so that you're not having to move water troughs around as well. Feeders hanging in inside the hen house, they're kept away from birds um, and, and able to move around with the birds. Automated doors that work on a light sensor that saves a lot of time and effort uh, for me being in uh, you know first light and, and last light as well um, 
a new mount shut him in um and uh, kind of reclaimed trailer tire in the left of the frame there uh which makes up a really decent dust bath so fill that with um with sand or, or, or earth um, to allow the birds to bather a little bit. And um, the good thing about that being a tie, you can sort of upend it and roll it from one paddock to the next and all of the sand or contents stay within. So little things like that, just to kind of make life easy and just keep the whole operation really, really lean. So labor costs are high, so you, per, per kind of product output, it's really important to make sure nothing's taking too long and everything's kind of quick and easy. And that was, that was a really fundamental part to, making sure that we got quickly to a point where the business was going to start being uh, positive cash flow. Um, Russ, there's just a couple of questions that have come through on sure. some of the cattle side. Just thought it was a good chance. Well, one, Chris has asked about, and this came in, I think, for the cattle, which is what is the grazing period rest interval that if you found works the best and does it or how does it change through the year? Yeah, good question. So, um, and, and a lot of people ask me that, and I think there's there's no hard and fast answer. Um, and you hear a lot of people having different theories about that. But in actual fact, I think you've got to get to know your own land. And I certainly saw across the farm at NEP that there are some of those more improved pastures that can take more regular ratings, you know, perhaps even as, as low as 21 days, um, whereas other fields are more suited to kind of 90 days. And, and a couple of fields in particular that we really wanted to change um, the pasture constituency where we're doing some quite quite hard winter grazing. They then need longer recovery. And so generally getting grazed um, once in the summer and once midwinter. And so I think you kind of have to adapt your grazing plan if you've got fields that need different treatment and have different expectations around rest periods that can all get thrown out of the water when you have a drought like we did last summer and you can have to really rethink all of that. Um, so I think for anyone kind of starting out that, it's good to have a, a, a kind of structure and idea of rest periods, but actually you've got to base your uh, movement decisions on, on observations on the land and, and how that plant growth is recovering and, and, and what you're trying to achieve as a whole. Um, and another question on about Actually, Gary's that's linked to that, which is stocking rate. So what is your stock? It's probably going to be quite challenging to calculate with chickens involved. But what's just what are you working on stocking mm -hmm. rate? Um, I scoped stocking. out that um, you know, kind of original plan and, and, and the farm is still growing. So um, I mentioned that only about a third of the land was fenced uh, initially. And, and I think nearly two thirds is now fenced with all the work that the team have been doing there to, to kind of bring more of it into the fold. So we haven't really got a fair understanding of what the what the stocking rates are yet but i i scoped it on one livestock unit um per acre or per half a hectare roughly um and and, and one livestock unit being being kind of 600 kilo uh live weight and so by weighing the herd regularly kind of um work that out um in terms of kilos of live weight fed per hectare um, which is kind of the, the consistent measure that you can do whatever your type of cow, whatever your age of animals. And, um, and, and that's, you know, where we were kind of at. So it's about, it's about 600 kilos, a half a hectare. Um, and it, I suppose, and also thinking of the <clears throat> guessing for the, what you'll come on to in terms of the market. So it was their targets in terms of how many animals, I suppose that's also on a prediction, isn't it, in terms of over the years? But is there guidance on they want to be able to sell one beast a week or three beasts? A... Yeah, that's definitely a consideration. And, and we're still to kind of test that market in full. What's also going on with the longhorns as the rewilding? And, and there's a, maybe up to 100 head of longhorns coming out of the rewilding each year. Um, that are going to NEP's own butchery now that's been open for a couple of years. That's mostly um, selling meat online, a business called NEP Wild Range. And, and so that was an established market. And so with the farm shop, uh, the need was going to be to kind of plug a gap of beef demand by the farm shop using the Sussex cattle. And so the Longhorns are quite seasonal when they come out of the rewild and they tend to be in their best condition for slaughter in the autumn coming up to kind of 30 months whereas there's a bit of a gap for beef supply 
from sort of January through to July. So the focus on the farm was to really kind of specialise in, in, in producing beef during those months. And what we worked on was uh, producing kind of 30 finished cattle per year. Some heifers we might retain for the breeding herd. So say half a dozen, which leaves 24 finished animals per year during six months of the year. Uh, so um, <clears throat> that's four a month. For okay. six months or two a month for the year average. Um, and quick question, any fruit? market garden and guest veg at the moment or is there fruit going in yeah so um no no fruit of any significance at the moment other than apples um now it was quite an interesting one because you think fruit's very saleable uh, and a good thing to stock in a farm shop and we work pretty closely with um a horticulturist called um, ian tolhurst or tolly as he's well known in in, in that world and, and he he really advised against mixing vegetables and fruit and, and I think for very good reason, they require different specialist skills and they also require lots of labor at the same time of year. And so he rightly pointed out that you can end up being spread too thinly trying to produce strawberries and, and carrots at the same time or, or whatever it may be. And he said better to focus your skills and capability on one thing at a time. And um one then jumping back to your compost did you get it analyzed from a, i'm guessing from a food web perspective um we didn't last year but we are this year and i i haven't seen the results of that yet um we've been in conversation with the land gardeners to try and help us understand how that compost might be doing We've done a kind of chemical analysis um, of, of three lots so far, which have you know, shown it to be OK and, and kind of improving the more, the better we've aerated it and turned it. But very much an early stage. And I think, you know, we're all, if we're going to just start with farmyard manure, actually, how do we make it a better product? And it doesn't all happen overnight. And so there's lots of learning to be had, um, turning, understanding of the, what the right things are to monitor. Well, the next region ag chat is going to be on worms. I've met a worm farmer. I'm slightly yeah. now addicted to worm farming. Um, uh, back to you. Sorry. Uh, are you planning any perennial vegetables? It's getting the level of detail you may not know from the market garden. Well, um, not yet, but it would be good to think about incorporating that. We, we looked at lots of different ways of kind of doing that market garden, you know, right from permaculture to more intensive field scale production um, and in the end we're sort of somewhere down the middle I suppose and, and hybridizing different ideas but also prioritizing what's most important getting getting the, the basics up and running getting vegetables established getting a market established for those vegetables but there are bits of the site that lend themselves to um, kind of different production um, and, and kind of looking at how we might might do that rhubarb beds for example um, could be really good, but um, early days on that front. And this is a very, this is an interesting question. So, did you choose the chicken species based on any criteria? I'm thinking larvae fly removal. Any species better at removing fly larvae from cow manure than the other? Good luck. No, is the simple answer. Um, so, the chickens, a really good question, though. Or, or it leads to a, an interesting answer perhaps for people. So um, most of the farm was organic already when I arrived, but I converted the, the remainder into organic, which is, is a sort of two year conversion period uh, on grassland. That period is just, just finished. So last year I ran the chickens on the non-organic or in conversion land because I wanted, and there was no point investing in fully organic birds um, for the pilot year. So I basically bought what I could find cheaply and what was available. And so most of these birds here are, are kind of semi-retired secondhand birds that were from three different flocks um, from neighboring farms that I, that I got to know. And, and that was a really good way to start at a low cost because I didn't know what the fox pressure was gonna be, any other predation, mink, for example, how the whole system was gonna work. So actually having older hens of any old breed 
was 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 a good starting point. Um, so, but but this year we've got on order 150 um, highline birds that will that will pull its arriving in April that will be fully organic, so that the eggs will be fully organic from this April. Um, and so that's a long answer to say, you know, I think this, these are what we started with, but I think it won't make any difference to their foraging ability. But what it does make the most difference is how they've been reared previous to having them. It's going to be interesting to see how these pullets get on if they've been reared indoors because of bird flu. Will we need to kind of teach them to, to roost in the, in the Ridgedale um, egg mobile? Will we need to encourage them to... Um, to, to sort of scratch around and, and look for the dung larvae. I mean, it's quite possible that we will. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of see how that how that pans out. But I think there's just a bit of an optimum with the with with the, the fly larvae. The eggs eggs flies lay their eggs, and by day ten, those eggs have hatched and flown away. So you've kind of got that window of of kind of day four to day nine. When the larvae are their biggest and juiciest and, and most attractive for a bird to eat. And I'm I'm guessing because of disease pressure, you won't keep any of the and and particularly I suppose organic status. So you you're not going to teach any of the chickens that know the system to teach them, are you? So it is they're going to be someone out pretending to be a chicken, like they do when they're feeding flamingo chicks. Well, maybe, hopefully not. Um, but yeah, no, the, these birds will have to go actually. Um, so they're going to probably go on marketplace or um, or rehoming chicken service, um, but you know they're mostly quite old. But they you know they they'll do as a backyard bird for for local families um, rather than uh, have to cull them all or send them off for chicken nuggets. But they um, yeah, they, it would be very useful to have them around with the new birds. I think there's definitely something in that that the birds you know birds flock together um, and. I found that when I brought in, I think the third flock that weren't so used to this type of perching system or laying system, I think it definitely helped that the others, you know, they, they copied the others and there's, there's a bit of that goes on in the chicken psyche. Okay, thank you. So um, what I should I say, the chat, there seems to be some problems with the chat, but if you're, um, the Q and A is working fine. So try that one. Um, just one question on the chickens before we move on about, dung beetles they might predate the beneficial insects as well as the larvae but is that partly timing as well yeah really good question and i haven't got to the bottom of that yet i suppose there's two things there's there's the timing and, and so we kind of hope that um or it sort of seems that five days after a fresh cow pat dung beetles have generally done what they're going to do and and perhaps they've buried their eggs beneath the dung pat or or they've just had a feed and flown away but we don't really know what impact the chickens could be having um so it's it's a risk that the chickens are eating our precious dung beetles however um <clears throat> there's a lot of cattle other cattle dung that the chickens are not actually getting to because i kind of had that small mob of cattle behind these 120 birds Whereas you know there's another fifty cattle in another mob elsewhere where they're you know where dung beetles are are at large and and not too affected by uh, not at all affected by chickens and not too affected by other other birds and crows for example that might be after that dung beetle larvae. Thanks, Russ. Uh, that's no more questions on the stock at the minute. Thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> oh, my screen's frozen again. Um, so I just just to sort of wrap up really what I was um, saying about regenerative agriculture and, and, and how important I think it is to evidence what we're, we're doing. And, and at the outset of the project two years ago at NEP, um, we wanted to really understand where our starting point was and then assessing how our management style was affecting changes. And we took a lot of lessons there from the, the, the development of the rewilding area at NEP where lots of things were being able to measure progress and measure changes. And in fact, how when the rewilding started, um, the estate didn't especially monitor some things like soil health because 
20, 25 years ago, it just wasn't really talked about. It wasn't so much of a thing back then. So we wanted to really delve deep into understanding what are the things we should measure now that in 20 years time might be really relevant. So um, as, as a team with kind of NEPS, a resident ecologist, um, we kind of took a triple bottom line approach to this and thinking about our environmental factors and our natural capital and all the things we might try and understand and measure and benchmark across the farm. Look also at the economics and how the business performs, how regenerative agriculture actually works, how it might influence um, local spending and the local economy as well. And then thirdly, the kind of social aspects to the project as well and how might we influence people's health through the food production uh, we're, we're doing, how we might create access to green spaces and actually help the local community uh, be healthier and, and happier as a result of that, how we might create jobs or even uh, volunteering opportunities to give people opportunity to get involved with the farm. So, so that that's kind of depicts our uh, all of the things we want to measure and, and measure regeneration of and rebuilding of. And of course, it's going to take a lot of time for some of these to um, really come into fruition. But that said, some of these things were able to measure progress very, very quickly. And in particular, we, we sort of delve deep into the soils, literally, uh, and try and understand what was going on there with chemical analysis, uh, using a local agronomist, and also trying to understand the biological performance of our soils as well. Um, and really, it you know, sits as a heavy clay. Um, organic matter was quite variable across some of the farm, some of the fields, um, and, and, and pretty good. Clay, of course, does hold on to organic matter much better than sandier soils. So understand we're a bit higher, but how could that be improved? Looking visibly at, at the soil structure, we use the Soil Mentor app, uh, which is pretty helpful in kind of guiding us through that process of, of benchmarking the soil, understanding what's happening. And I think as an overall conclusion, there was quite a lot of variety because of the different management that had gone on across the regenerative farm previously, but also that there was perhaps a general lack of soil life. Some fields had plenty of worms, but most didn't have that many. And I, and I really felt that, and that's, that kind of informed our mob grazing strategy, in fact, and how we did that, how we rolled it out to actually reinvigorate that soil and bring it back to life. And so for anyone starting out, I think it's really important to understand your soils and actually therefore what kind of um, action they need to um, get them get them into good health. Um, here we are, dung beetle surveying, rifling through uh, fresh dung pats, lots of different techniques to do that, and um, found a lot of different species actually, and, and most of them seem to be flying over from the rewilding. In the rewilding areas, there are known populations of uh, lots of different dung beetles, including some quite rare species, and that's partly because there's dung all year round in the rewilding areas. And so there's a there's a kind of year round source, whereas in a lot of landscapes where cattle are, are brought in the winter, um, the dung beetles lose that lose that uh, habitat during the winter months. But at least there was a good um, there was a good community of dung beetles there to fly over. And it was just amazing how quickly they were flying over to the region farm um, and colonizing the dung. So we kind of saw improvements there pretty quickly. Um, small mammal. And just grazing differently, enabling longer tussia, tussica, tuskier grass uh, as giving more habitat um, and, and feed to uh, things like this little field vole. Um, and what's going on in the daytime is also a lot going on at night time. So things like moth trapping is enabling us, enabling us to find uh, different moths or other uh, nocturnal creatures that are existing. Um, on the farm and, and I really love this moth here I can't remember the name of it but it kind of timed its emergence and coloration with the discoloration of the uh, blackthorn leaf as that turns in the autumn so some you know really insightful stuff um, once you sort of start going looking and finding stuff and just being wowed by the sheer biodiversity that was that was evident actually quite quite easily without without too much scientific um rigor and investigation and this is this is a november day um last year you know, 24 hours after the mob had been through grazing and just showing how much uh, spider activity there was 
to, to kind of create all of these spiders webs in such a short time after the cattle have been through. Of course, this is, you know, it's quite a common sight on farms to see lots of spiders webs, but just the speed with which they did it, but the fact they were also living there. If this field had been cut for silage or hay, it would have obliterated most of that insect life, whereas this technique of, of grazing through the land greatly improves the opportunities for biodiversity and it can be seen here very clearly. Um, and then just to kind of finalise um, and talk about how nature fits into the wider landscape, it's all very well us doing these things on the, on the farm and in the individual fields, but we're very conscious, and I said at the beginning, how we get the two types of land management happening alongside one another to really work together and how we can think about that helping us learn about landscape connectivity. So we really focus some efforts around our water corridors or the riparian areas, the riparian corridors, where there are water courses that run um, from the uh, rewilding areas and, and through the regenerative farm and, and vice versa the other way as well, uh, and how they might provide opportunities for nature biodiversity to, to move through the landscape. And we're not kind of talking about big things like uh, um, uh, deer or, or, or cattle. It's about smaller things, insects, bird life, bats, and so on. And then also how our hedgerows might help connect up areas of woodlands to one another and how those hedgerows might help us connect up through the landscape to our neighbours as well. And, and the kind of crisscross of, of corridors providing lots of opportunity and permeability for nature across the farm. And uh, that's really helped to inform particularly the edges of our fields and, and how we've been grazing them. And in particular, the hedgerows are a really interesting one because some of the hedgerows uh, we started with, particularly on in the fields that were grazed by sheep, um, you know, a lot of the, the bases have been lost to those hedgerows. Um, we call these the kind of sheep wrecked uh, hedges where there's a real uh, lack of base, basal undergrowth in the left and, and, and the hedges become so thin on the right that there's not much of a hedge left at all. And that's quite poor for biodiversity and quite poor for, for biodiversity to move through the landscape. So what we've felt we're working towards is something that looks a lot more like this, a much more varied structure, but a, a, a denser, uh, vibrant structure of, of hedgerows that's actually, in fact, quite wide and that's sprawling out, that has dense canopy and bare ground in the middle that suits lots of insects to move in a, in a kind of protected tunnel uh, and, and small mammals as well. And then he's kind of have these gradient edges or ecotones on the edge of the hedgerows where we've got different types of habitat kind of tapering down into the into the pastures and grasses to the sides. What we could also have in some situations is, is actually a water course as part of this as well. So that's a water course meandering amongst the hedgerow. And also um, this is a straight linear hedgerow. And as you look at it, on a plan view, it maybe wiggles around, which means you get kind of different aspects to the sun, to the wind that suit certain insects uh, and biodiversity as well. And, and so that's the kind of aim for those hedgerows and really set about putting in place a kind of 20 year hedgerow rotation where hedges are at different stages of, of billowing out and then perhaps being coppiced or laid uh, in between to um, to kind of reset them and re and, and rethicken them, and you know, a very traditional thing to do, harvest lots of wood in the process, uh, can be kind of expensive practice to do, but countryside stewardship can support some of the costs towards that. So, some of that is going on this winter to um, to do some coppicing and, and hedge laying. And um, but I think what's really relevant here in, in, in creating these hedgerow corridors is is trying to move away from using steel and timber fencing because that really creates quite a barrier for um for hedge, hedge laying and coppicing it can be quite a nuisance for that uh, it can also represent quite a significant cost um especially nowadays and um and, and generally sort of getting in the way of the nature and, and these fences can be pretty nasty for nature i actually saw this 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 yesterday um on, on his feet. This is what's left of a deer, and it obviously jumped the fence, got its legs stuck in, in barbed wire. And you know, it really can happen. You see that quite often. Um, and so these fences, whilst they serve a really good purpose for keeping livestock in, cannot be very helpful to nature. And even, even smaller mesh fencing can you know change where hedgehogs go and, and, and can go, perhaps if hedgehogs are 
being particularly useful for eating slugs and so forth. So it's important to think like nature does and see how we can change the way we, we fence or manage. So how should we actually manage our hedgerow edges and, and, and fence them? Well, um, I think these collars, GPS collars, are, are pretty revolutionary. And so in trialling the use of the no-fence collars uh, alongside the polywire fencing as well to help us manage those hedgerow edges. And, and they've been pretty good for that. They're really good for kind of habitat creation. They're expensive compared to polywire, I found, but they do enable you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do particularly when you're kind of creating those soft go tone edges. Um, so happy to talk some more about them. Um, and then this is my last slide just to kind of finish on. So working with lots of farmers uh, with Pasture for Life uh, and also perhaps going on a bit of a journey myself for the last couple of years and taking a, a big idea and, and setting up a regenerative farm in reality. Um, I saw a real um, up and down journey for, for farmers actually, and, and for myself, lots of things um, happening that provide affirmation and inspiration, but also lots of things that get in the way of, um, of making progress. And, and I'll, I can dwell on this slide for those of you interested to kind of read it, but I think it's something to be aware of before kind of stepping in and, and making big changes on a farm or even starting from scratch just kind of thinking about all those things that can go on during that farmer journey um, and, and getting to success. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a lot of work, a lot of hard graft, and it, and it requires us to run businesses very, very well, um, as well as dealing with new ideas and, and new developments along the way. So um, I think it's, it's good to think about all those different things and, and, and be aware of the bigger process rather than getting overwhelmed of, um, of hurdles in the way. So that's it, just as a very quick overview, those are my contact details. Um, I don't know if we, we we kind of covered it at the beginning, but I've actually moved away from Sussex now, I moved away from NEP, so I finished my full-time role there in January. Um, the team have been sort of taking over, um, running the day-to-day -day cattle, chickens and uh, and vegetables. And so um, I'm, I'm sort of surplus to requirements, um, but having a bit of oversight now, and that was, Really what I went there to do was to, was to set this farm up as a, as a flagship and demonstration of regenerative agriculture alongside rewilding. And, and that's what I've done. And so now returning to Herefordshire for the time being and, and doing a bit more consultancy work and mentoring on the back of that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ross. Really interesting. I, and I think it's just, it's just a very um, different or articulating what a lot of us are thinking in terms of that journey map, isn't it? In terms of peak, peaks and troughs, and that some and it's uh, and I think it's it's hinted at within that. Hoping he's coming back in a second. Um, in terms of finding people that help you up from those dips, isn't it? It's the support network that's important. What we should have also said is Ross is dealing with a cold, so thank you very much, but also persevering through that. Thanks. I think that journey map is is really really good. It's really accurate, and you've got because it is it is up and down, isn't it? And you do question yourself and think, why am I making my life so complicated? <laughs> um, I think it's really good. Um, so there's a uh, there's a query from Annabelle just that she would like to hear more about the collars, if possible. Yeah, so there's a few different collars on the market now. Um, no fence have probably been the leading uh, technology in the UK, developed in Norway. They have a battery pack in them, two solar panels on the side. They look a lot like a cowbell. They hang a lot like a cowbell with a rubber strap and a chain. And they GPS locate the animals every 15 minutes. And in an app on your phone, you can draw the virtual boundary or field edge or fence line virtual fence line on the app and if the gps detects that that animal is moving close to that virtual boundary it will then start updating the gps more regularly kind of sending signals up and down into the sky to the satellite um, and in fact several times a second when it realizes it gets close if it then animal crosses that line the uh, collar will emit an audio signal kind of buzzing sound 
uh, which the animals can hear and, and farmers can hear if they stood relatively close. If that animal ignores that audio signal, it then gets an electrical pulse on the chain that's hanging around its neck. And uh, that's about a, the pulse is about a tenth of, of a pulse of a, of, of a sort of normal energizer in a polywire. So it's not too strong, but it's enough to make them realize and turn around. Now, what happens over time, and you can kind of see this data in the app, is that the animals start to learn that the audio cues mean that there's a potential for an electrical pulse. So they start to respond just the audio um, instead. <clears throat> and so that's quite good. Sounds really good from an animal welfare point of view, but it's quite good to actually have as animals trained to sound. And so you can be very versatile with how you set up your virtual boundary in your um, on your app. And you can kind of use it around shapes. I used it actually in an orchard to try and um, keep animals from going and rubbing against the trees and it, it sort of worked to an extent. Um, and yeah, that's kind of basically how it works. It provides so much data on animal movements that's really fascinating gives us a lot more insight into animal behavior. I think as farmers, we have to kind of learn to manage animals slightly differently. I would say they are, I would, well, my experience is they tend to be more nervous because they're not quite sure where the boundary is, where if they can see a hedge or a ditch or a physical fence, they can be a bit more certain about, um, they've got a visual cue, whereas on, with, with the collar, um, the virtual boundary, you haven't got that. And I think it's really important as, as stockmen to or women to to put our virtual boundaries where there is some kind of physical feature so that the animal uh, can kind of comprehend that a little bit more i think it's akin to a bird flying into a glass window it's kind of happily flying along doesn't see anything and is you know, gets a shock um and so we have to think about the same with cattle and better to give them some visual cues to assist them and how um, how, how oh. much are they to to buy it roughly? Uh, they're about 250 quid a shot, but I think they're probably coming down in price. Um, as with all technologies, they do sort of get cheaper in time. Um, there's also a subscription fee of about £50 a year, which collar, which kind of pays for the, um, the licensing to the satellite. And there's also two SIM cards in it as well, so it can kind of work off uh, 4G. And um, so there's a couple kind of maintenance costs to that. I think it will improve no end. And, and I think I looked at a, another system in Spain um, that was uh, kind of cheaper, but didn't quite have so much data collection uh, that can work. And there's also now kind of GPS trackers fitting into ear tags with little solar panels on the back being developed in Holland. So I think you know that there's going to be lots of different um, applications of that technology in the future. And I think they really can help where fencing is prohibitive, um, perhaps in commons or start to special scientific interest or where there's a lot of public access and where fences could really get in the way, um, but enabling farmers still to move their animals around in a, in, a, in a loose form. You have to plan ahead though. If you want to get those animals into the yard, you need to kind of spend a few days adjusting the virtual boundary, working them towards uh, the yard because they can be quite difficult to drive or, or or call through um a gateway if they're like no 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 we've been over there and we got a shock so we're not <laughs> we know there's something funny going on in the ground that you know whatever um, and i think fergus asked a mess uh, asked a question saying how how dense um can the mob be with collars um I I would say not that dense actually. You can you can get denser with polywire. I'd say the reason for that is that the smaller you have the area, the more the smaller you have the grazing area, the more times the cattle are, are interacting with the edges or the boundary. And that, as I mentioned, the the collar then starts updating more frequently when it's close to the the boundary, and that drain, can drain the battery quite quickly. If the collars aren't working too hard, the solar panels on the side will keep them fully charged year round. If they're working really hard all day, then the batteries will soon deplete. And then you have another problem of having to change the batteries. Um, so it's better not to have them too tight. So they don't really suit high intensity mob grazing all that well, in my experience. I think they're far better in kind of weekly move paddocks where you've got a much lower um, 
density and, and perhaps trying to achieve a different type of grazing, mm -hmm. less about trampling, more about conservation. Yeah, okay. And is there one more question? Um, what, um, what, Russ, is your biggest takeaway from what you have learned and what, what um, and how will you implement it in the future? That's a good question. I think that um, it's, you know, it's really interesting, as I mentioned at the beginning, working with lots of different farmers right across the UK and Ireland and really um, observing what they've been going through. But that's a whole different thing to when you're doing it yourself, in fact. And so whilst I understood the principles I wanted to apply starting out, actually then doing it for yourself and, and kind of realising the, the small little details um, you know, for example, with electric fencing and, and earthing and things like that, just to make how to how important that attention to detail is to have um, a good lean system. And can I think there's so many little things like that that I've learned from doing it in practice um, that I'm, I'm I now have a much deeper understanding what it's like to roll out regenerative agriculture, be that cattle, chickens, or or, or otherwise. Uh, and we spoke earlier about um, when you trial the small flock of hens. And can you just talk a bit about the actually selling the product? Because I know from from the st <clears throat> stuff we've done here, we're we're PFLA um, accredited, but there aren't people banging on our door saying we want your beef. Can you just expand a little bit on on that? Yeah, certainly. I think as farmers, only half the work is in producing the product. The other half is, is in marketing it. And, and we can do that quite simply, taking products to market or selling it to the mass market and, and maybe getting a lower price, but it's an easy option. It's a whole different ballgame when you're trying to sell direct or establish your own market. And there can be a lot of work involved to do that. Um, I suppose I was, I was lucky with the chickens. One of the flocks I bought um, for the farm came with an egg whatsapp group because th that farmer had a small customer base there weren't many but I'm, i mean maybe 10 or a dozen uh people uh and then i went to all the staff that work at nep and then to the local village and said you know explain that we've got these these um these chickens and wonderful eggs and, and kind of built it up then and starting this time last year the egg, egg production was just sort of kind of increasing as daylight increasing. So I was able to kind of match that with, with building the market at the same time. There's also a little um, campsite shop in the clamping area at NEP. So that they took quite a lot of the, of, of the bulk of the eggs. Um, and those kind of relationships were quite key. I suppose the egg WhatsApp group was quite good for sending updates to people and um the egg customers are kind of showing to, helping to tell the story of what's going on getting their feedback on the quality of the eggs they felt really involved in the product as well certainly gained a few customers that were living in houses overlooking the fields where the chickens were that kind of worked really well because they're like oh my god i've never seen chickens reared like this we really want the eggs because we you know we believe in that we don't want to buy from the supermarket kind of thing and so that that was very helpful so lots of different ways to establish a market there and i think also growing that market more slowly is really important um and i think kind of beef wise and it, and it can be hard if you're i think being closer to like bigger places like london it does make it easier where there is there's more there's more trade going on but there's a lot to be said for kind of networking with people that are looking for a great product and i think it's all very well producing a great product but we're not able to sell it then it's of, of no real use and i think we have to we as farmers have to be the conduit to get that information out there um to um to potential customers and, and networking is a big part of that i think and yeah. storytelling yeah any more questions liz i think if i could just add add a comment to your earlier question nick about um biggest takeaway in learning i think selling eggs to the villagers kind of reminded me that when the project started there was a lot of apprehension in the local community around what was going to happen on the farm and some people felt a bit threatened around um, their access to public footpaths and whether they'd feel safe with horned cattle and so on. And, and I had to do a kind of lot of um, conversations with, with villagers to allay a lot of those fears. Um, 
you know, and there was a little bit of hostility actually, which was which was quite interesting, and, and I didn't expect, but it it didn't really bother me, but it showed, I think, in rural communities how disconnected some people have become from um, agriculture and how how useful we can be as farmers to educate and 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 build bridges. And ultimately, that was very helpful for me because it it led to egg customers and and hopefully uh, beef customers and you know gain vegetable customers through it as well. And I think it's easy as farmers to to kind of shy away from that. It's not perhaps our natural environment to go into the public sphere. Sometimes I don't mind it, but I know not all farmers like to do that. Equally, not all consumers or 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 people living in the countryside are necessarily confident enough to go and speak to a farmer and to understand what it is they're doing and why. And it's, Lewis, it's, you've been doing you've been doing that at home haven't you lately? Well I'm trying to do so we're planning some farm walks so um alongside the village pub really so basically um so our meat being used within the meal offering I don't know why I just didn't use the word meal but anyway and um but then a farm walk, so around my our farm and also my cousin's farm, so like a few hours, and it's um, and it's only just starting. Our plan we're doing open farm Sunday for the first time this year as well, so it's sort of getting us warmed up to that idea. But I yeah, getting as you have more conversations with non farmers, you realise how many more conversations we need, mm. and and um. And the challenge now, it's about offering, I mean, obviously the farm walk is 25 quid to come, but that includes meal, but that isn't accessible to everybody. So then it's also offering different things as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it is it it is difficult because everybody's got enough going on, haven't they? But it's, it's for me, I, I, it feels like a fundamental part of the, my definition of regen is that connection is coming back or has to do it. Part of yeah. the work is on that connection as Al is as illustrated by Russ's diagram my I suppose the challenge and I went to a meeting a couple of weeks ago when we're asking a lot aren't we from a regenerative perspective doing there is a massive risk of burnout doing if we have to achieve all of this we have to be incredible I think my we have to know I think my terrible analogy was we have to recognize a chaffinch and we also have to talk to people and we have to market our own stock and we have to be managing the welfare of all our animals there is just so much so and how I don't think any of us have the answer but is there ways I suppose of how we help sort of build up coping mechanisms for that or learning stronger boundaries or whatever it happens to be absolutely I think it's really relevant and you know we we wouldn't be very good advocates of region I could feel burning out and um you know working too much and and um being unhealthy or having accidents as a result of that as well you know which is we know is very commonplace in agriculture so i think it needs a lot of deep thought and, and setting boundaries but also deep thought into the how we go about setting up businesses how do we keep them efficient and lean and um, and profitable where possible to to ensure we're not making ourselves lots of work but also i think just asking for help and and there are lots of people out there that will have different perspectives that's where that community of, of others on, on on this kind of journey is really important bouncing ideas and seeing different perspectives but also being at hand to um you know, help out with with things going on i was very lucky um at net because the the rewilding area has a stockman and assistant stockman and so you know, on the kind of days that I needed an extra pair of hands for sorting cattle, they would come across and, and, and lend a hand. And, you know, that was a bit two way as well. I'd, I'd help them if they needed a hand as well. Um, and, and perhaps that's not something very easy by a by a lone farmer, um, but, but they're always neighbours to engage with. And I think, um, you know, I met some great people working in Sussex and some you know, wonderful people are prepared to help and roll up the sleeves. And, and not just other farmers as well, members of the community. I've been blown away by uh, the volunteers that have sort of come forward and, and NEP's got quite a following for volunteers, people that want to be involved in what's going on. But I think we can all access that right across the country. There are lots of people, be them retired or off work for different reasons that are looking to have purpose. They want to be outside in nature. 
doing something important for the environment and 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 we as farmers have got a great platform to be able to do that um and if you're prepared to kind of show them the way and and, and help them be involved it does require a bit of patience but it can be a huge help and support when uh, when there's a lot else on i think it's also that and it's someone to have a chat with isn't it it's not in the foot a lot of farmers are working alone a lot and it's just nice to have a mate there and hopefully they're useful yeah definitely we had a, a volunteer who um never failed to turn up i mean he'd come in all weathers and um he was kind of late 70s and and, and yeah he just absolutely loved it and he, and he just loved doing really simple tasks and um very smart guy but i just found it really heartwarming that he, you know, he he would turn always turn up and and muck in whatever, and that's um, you know kind of gave some perspective on uh, the other things going on. Um, can I just plot vegetables? So I've got a dream that every farm has a little vegetable plot and sells the veg locally, and it'll never happen, but it's a dream. How 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 easy has the has the vegetable enterprise been to to start and? where did you go for um to learn stuff i'd say it's been really challenging actually um oh. we, we've succeeded i think because of uh, the growers that we found um but even producing some amazing vegetables um great personalities behind them marketing the vegetables has, has been a challenge and and that came as quite a surprise really because uh, vegetable production kind of started as as the country was coming out of COVID lockdowns, and so there was this you know big drive for local produce and people really supporting local. And I think that kind of way waned a little bit as we were upping production. And so um, it, it it was it was more of a challenge than we expected. And we've kind of tried to really interrogate why that was the case, um, and and a lot of it seems to be around convenience. People are very used to kind of shopping several times a week now and buying little and often and, and quite ready prepared. And so having something like a celeriac, which requires a bit more thought and, and preparation to turn into a good meal, um, was a little bit off-putting to some people. Nonetheless, as with marketing the eggs, kind of starting slowly and building up um, does seem to have been uh, worthwhile. I think with Nepps Farm Shop coming online this year, all that work, although it's been very hard building those markets in the last two years, will mean that you know we can hit the ground running with the farm shop uh, this summer. Um, in terms of where I went to learn about market gardening, um, I suppose I'm quite a keen vegetable grower myself, so I kind of understood the basics, but I mean, the, the very basics, and it's a whole different scale operating and growing on two acres. I think that, um, but nonetheless, some good communities to engage with, some peer groups, um, some good groups on Facebook, um, and and, a, and shout out again to Tolly, who's you know he's he's kind of cited in in George Monbiot's Regenesis book um, as being this kind of saint of, of animal free vegetable production. So he is a little bit controversial in that aspect because he doesn't use any animal manure in in his farm in Oxfordshire, but nonetheless, he's been at it for nearly fifty years and he's really he really knows how to do stuff and is, is, is a very wise person to speak to for anyone um, interested in, in, in going down that route. But ultimately, I think it's, it's finding the right growers um, and they are few and far between, in fact. And it's not a it's not a get rich quick career to go into. And um, I think that's that's perhaps part of the challenge. It's, it's a very hard business to, to make money. Um, but Net felt it was you know, a very important part of the story and that market garden is cited so that people that are arriving at the farm shop drive past it, they look down the wonderful rows of vegetables. And we hope that will in itself sell that produce. And by keeping a short supply chain and a lean business, we hope it can it can work in due course. But you know, a lot of money has been spent to um to get the farm up and running as it is, and it's gonna still take some while to uh, turn it into a positive cash flow. No, and uh, well, you touched on the labour. I just it is. I was talking to a guy who was a grower, and it's it's a. Do we think we think farming's hard? Being a market gardener is it? Is hardcore. 
Yeah. Anyway, that's that's not very positive, but yeah, full respect to them. But there's an element of I share Nick's dream of that mixed plate being on farm and doing part of it would be in the carbon calling conference later in the year. But yeah, and it is it's just it's back to this point about burnout. We like the risk is you you take on loads of different enterprises because it's new and shiny and actually you don't do any of it quite well enough. Yeah. It's better not to um, try and do everything ultimately and, and to, to work, build teams that have the specialist skills to to deliver those things. And, and maybe Nick, you know, other people. Well, I've got a man. But... Okay. Found yeah. a <laughs> I found Malcolm. I've got Malcolm. So he's, 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 he's doing it for us on a small scale. Um, and you have just got to, yeah, you can't do it all. And yeah, Malcolm knows what he's doing. So where the he, hell have you found? Well, no, this is not the topic. But where <laughs> the hell have you found Malcolm? Um, <laughs> well, I just, I just said to someone that I needed a, a it sounds awful, a lonely old man who wanted to spend some time looking at amazing view gardening. And Malcolm is not a lonely old man, but he does want to spend some time here. So it's perfect, perfect. It's a very rewarding work, actually. I mean, it's not always the best of weather, but it, it is. And, and I think the people I've met that are doing it, they really have a deep a deep motivation to produce food, uh, work with the soil and, and be out in all weathers. And, and, and that's great. We need people like that. So let's create opportunities. Those of us who've got the land and, and the markets to, to provide those opportunities. Because the, the trouble is it's shifting baseline. So, so in Penrith, there is nowhere now, there's no, there's one bed shop, but it's pretty standard. Do, do you know what I mean? So it's supermarkets or, you know that, that there's no choice whereas in cities i guess there's more of a choice um and then people just forget what proper veg tastes like so yeah 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 the other thing um if it's not kind of selling direct and um and local is that there are sometimes wholesalers that are able to take kind of niche or quality products i know a few market gardeners that really kind of focus on that one in particular that grows products um, just for kind of Chinese restaurants, very particular uh, foods that they wholesale around the country. And, and at NEP, the girls there were really lucky to um, um, do a deal with um, a little wholesaler that started up post-COVID uh, called Shrub. And, and they, they collected from quite a lot of organic growers in the southeast and delivered up to London once or twice a week to kind of high-end restaurants and that that was a real bit of a godsend actually because they were able to take a lot of the produce that we weren't selling locally so there are some opportunities like that as well and, but and yeah it'd be many... great if local people would uh would would buy more of it and and perhaps yeah. there's a bit of also being able to add value to produce as well you know when we get the glut of different things which nepa are really hoping that with the cafe and kitchen they can help manage some of those gluts a little bit more as well and, and turn them into added value products to then use at other times of the year and you'll have um do you have groups coming around the farm to look look around group do you have groups of far farmers yes yeah so last year I had about 250 people come around in all um in, in different kind of groups some bespoke farmer groups from around the world and also um advertised tours that all sorts of people came along on um they're really good i think any farmer can do that as well great to hear liz is, is starting that i think there's a lot that people are prepared to pay for to come and see and understand what's going on in their neighborhood or what's going on on farm um so yeah you know so that that was a pretty important part of the of the business last year uh and i think they're planning to carry on doing that in some form in years to come yeah and i probably should have asked this question right at the beginning but how did you actually start? Was it a big piece of paper? Was it getting people in a room? Was it, that's the bit I'm intrigued by. I would say I would have started with a big bit of paper, but that's mean anything. Well, we were in lockdown at the time, so it was all done on Zoom actually. Uh, and I met with the estate manager at NEP and, and the owner of NEP and, and just kind of listened to what, what their aspirations were and, and you know some of those aspirations are really big and they read the books about you know different american farmers doing all this amazing stuff and you know they wanted all that um and, and then it was kind of just getting some context of um how all that fits in with with what's actually possible and what the resources are 
And I suppose it's an evolving conversation then is, well, here's some big ideas of what, what we could do, but what's the starting point? And I think those those early kind of soil pits that were dug were, were, were quite important because they shed a lot of light on the kind of activity that we needed to plan thereafter. Gaining a bit of a feeling for the farming infrastructure was important just to get a kind of sense of how much fencing there was to do. Um, water, I mean, water's, water was a really challenging thing because lots of water troughs around the farm and thought, great, you know, we've got watering points, but it turned out a lot of the uh, water troughs were kind of redundant, didn't work, or there were problems. And so, you know, that's that's all taken time and is still being developed um, as we speak. So um, there's always the things you can't see coming, um, but you have to be prepared and ready for, for dealing with. So it's very much an evolving conversation, I suppose, and, and but starting with some big ass hairy goals from the outset um, to, um, to to set set the sky as the limit and then figure out what's what's realistic, what's reasonable and develop it from there really. Um, I think also for anyone that is starting out is really understanding why why they're doing it, what are the motivations? Um, you know, some really good TED talks on starting with why, like Simon Sinek's, which are really, really good for any business to apply and, and think about what are the motivations for making stuff happen, what are the values under which that business wants to operate. Um, because you know, when the going gets tough, that the you have to kind of dig deep to those values and, and motivations to keep going. Um and uh I think having a <clears throat> having a plan that so I produced a business plan before I moved down to Sussex um, with the owners and the state manager and um, you know we banked that around a lot actually a lot of toing and froing on that um, and I suppose I, I I sort of without knowing the land really well and knowing the soil type coming from the west of the country um, you know I kind of tried to predict what would be achievable and, and reasonable in terms of stocking densities and then if there's any improvement on that then then that's that's great but don't overcommit initially i think is really important and it's got to work think... if you don't overcommit it's got to work financially or or see that it's gonna gonna work out eventually and it, well it's just as you say it's, it was you you were employed weren't you to deliver their vision which in but at least I suppose then that was helpful, wasn't it? You had other people just thinking what that what they would like to look at when they drove down the a road in three years' time. Anyway, That's right. I, <clears throat> I suppose yeah. it, it, it's quite interesting, especially you know, if you're just a farmer on your own, in some ways your decision making process is much simpler because the buck stops with you and you make a decision. If you're a family or a couple team then there's a little bit more discussion to be had when you're a, a non-related team should we say or, or colleagues you've then got a lot of different perspectives and a lot more um decision makers so to, and the bigger the, the group of decision makers the bigger the committee comes and, and and the longer it can take to get decisions but you can end up with with more solid decisions as a result and more buy-in from everybody if, if everybody has the chance to uh speak be listened to and, and have a different perspective and then find that that balance and i suppose that's something i've got good at through sort of facilitating farmer groups in the in the past is kind of everybody having a say and figuring out what do we all agree on as a as a way forward and i suppose that's what that's also what we did um you know with some quite different perspectives really at the start sort of net um, together with my own kind of vision and what I thought would be achievable by myself and trying to really balance that out and it's been a constant juggle but uh, I feel we've 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 had a lot we've got a lot to show for two years of effort now. I just um, had a question in about the dairy just yeah you're not you haven't done that yet have you can you just explain where you where you're at with that um, so I suppose starting from the marketplace, there seems to be an appetite for local dairy produce. Um, 
there's a you know kind of increase in um, local milk vending machines and with a farm shop and cafe we're fairly confident there's a market there for a small amount of milk and dairy produce so that's number one kind of um green light <clears throat> the um the, the slightly challenging thing is kind of managing the biosecurity of of milking herds probably it's too risky to do raw milk but actually if there needs to be then should you keep those animals separate um and with one farmyard at the moment around which most of the land exists it's kind of that could be quite a challenging um situation and so we need to get the rest of the fields fenced and grazable before we've then got a bit more space and flexibility to, to bring in another livestock enterprise. The old farmyard, in fact, used to be a dairy farm, although it hadn't been used for sort of 20 plus years. Um, so there is there is the remains of a, of a milking parlour there, but probably more likely would be a mobile bale set up um, to take out the fields to, to milk the animals. But it's it's kind of on the back burner for now, and I think there's been a lot else to get up and running, um, and, and not least to get the farm shop open before that's probably explored further. The other thing is that, as we were saying earlier, there's a lot of specialist skills needed for all these different enterprises, and it's really hard. You know, I find it really hard juggling all the different things and suddenly have to be an expert in in poultry management as well as cattle and growing vegetables, and maybe there's a better model of of doing it where we've got a team this is you know what joel salatin does really and others where you've got a team made up of specialists that don't spend all their time and all their occupation doing that but they are it's part of their existence um and and, and they focus on that and they're part of a bigger team all working together on on the platform of, of a farm or it's that we think well Let's not go down the road of dairy and, and milk. Let's work with another neighbouring farmer who, who meets our values and, and form a partnership with them. And so they already have the infrastructure, the livestock, the, the, the knowledge and, and, and do a deal with them and provide them with the market. And I think that's probably something we could all be doing more of. So the, the fruit question earlier, why aren't we producing any fruit? Well, you know, specialist skills, time, labour and so on. And, and there's a quite a good fruit grower down the road so why not work with them instead um rather than trying to recreate something new and take that risk ourselves perfect thanks russ just conscious of time so but thank you it's been brilliant lots of really positive feedback so thank you very much for being so open and working through a cough so thanks again mm. um nick what's your take home from this evening uh, my take home probably is that we need to involve more people in our decisions. Because it's very holistic. Us. I know there's only two of us, and sometimes we're like, uh, "One bam." We've got Malcolm now. <laughs> no, got Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's lovely, Liz. You'll love him. Love him. <laughs> this, oh, he's so good. Um, uh, and he arrives, and sometimes I don't even know he's been. Anyway, um, so I think we need to. <laughs> We need to have a bit of a sounding board and um, just kind of test our decisions a little bit more. Um, what about you? Um, although I'm I'm currently working through a countryside stewardship scheme, so I'm I was interested in the sort of I think it because obviously that's a five to ten year plan, isn't it? But our, this idea of a twenty year plan is actually what we need to be thinking about from a hedge perspective and various things. So um, I've started to think about the hedge corridors that we've got already and then how we can enhance them really. But yeah, ours are not, they're not, they're, we historically would be all layered hedges here. So Jean, they've, they're just not as exciting as the sort of picture in terms of wideness, but they are, they're not quite sheet wrecked either. So but yeah, I that's. Think, I, I think Russ's picture of the, um corridors i think that is really good i think and also his um whatever chart that was called that was really good um so yeah but no it was just yeah it's just it's well just interesting really interesting so thanks again um, russ yeah thank you so coming up 
Um, we have got next month. It's worms. Yeah. With your worm lady, who you um, collared. I made friends of. with at the. I say friends. She might consider me a stalker, but yeah, I'm friends with her. I met her at the Oxford Real Farming Conference, and uh, she's yeah. Next one is the 13th of March, and then she's going to come and do an event on my farm sometime in May, I think. Um, and then um, two things. So I've got a flax lady for May, the May chat. Um, yeah. and, and also Fergus Henderson, who I think is on the call, he's coming to Cumbria. So if there's any Cumbrians, Fergus is coming up on the 29th of March for a meeting here. Um, he's a bit of a grazing god. Um, I'm hoping Reno is going to turn into Fergus when he's Fergus's age. Um, and he's going to come here and talk about grazing um, and plants. But you'll we'll publicise that. So yeah, it's an yeah. open event, isn't it? So and, our, and we've then... nearly got a, a new website, haven't we? So when that's we'll post that too. Um, yeah. So I'll send something out about the thirteenth. But yes, yeah, bring your worm-related questions to that. Um, and if you want to have a look, her website is under Urban Worm. So she runs commercially runs quite a lot of wormeries for dealing with food waste, so the Ministry of Defence, for example, or Oaxaca, so she'll run commercial level wormers for them, which is so interesting. That sounds quite, um, yeah, exciting. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm stalking her, just saying. Anyway, on that note. <laughs> thank you, Russ, and thank, thank you, you to everyone. <laughs> Bye for soon. now. Bye-bye.